I'd like to welcome everybody. This is a uh, a basic uh, class here. We're calling it Lamarche uh, 101. So uh, some of this stuff is something that some of you may know, but uh, what we feel it's a basics and it's a history. It's the overview. We're going to look at a basic DC system. We're going to look at the charging technologies uh, a little bit. Uh, uh, to kind of see what's going on with that and what advantages and disadvantages of those will be. And finally, we're going to end it up with a technology comparison chart. So um, this is just the first uh, you know, look forward to uh, more of these uh, webinar type things uh, in the future. Uh, there are going to be some uh, varying details. There'll be a part two to this one coming up uh, probably in a couple of weeks, as well as some other more detailed ones covering things like the technologies and other new products that we have. So with that, I'd like to uh, get started. Um, Covering a little bit about uh, LaMarche here. We were founded in 1945 by Austin LaMarche. Um, how we kind of got started was after Austin come back from World War II, uh, he went to work at his father's pipe organ factory. So the LaMarches actually made pipe organs uh, initially. So uh, at the time, a pipe organ was powered by like a large motor generator set because it needed DC. So. Uh, the generator sets, they were loud, they're noisy, they're, you know, bulky and dirty. Uh, and, you know, let's face it, a lot of times for a pipe organ, you're in a church or, you know, a concert hall. So uh, those areas are not really conducive to something like a motor generator set. So Austin set about to uh, develop the world's first um, DC power supply for a pipe organ. And what he came up with was the Org Electra. So that's our Model A9. And um, it's from that we spread out into uh, the marine world, you know, uh, figured they boats need battery chargers uh, for their starting batteries, uh, engine start markets, um, utility, uh, control, process controls, uh, eventually development into um, things like a forklift battery. So all that kind of spread from the humble beginnings of the A9 and the Org Electra in the corner of Austin's uh, father's pipe organ factory. So. Uh, we're still family owned. We're owned by Judy and Rolf LaMarche. Uh, they're the son and daughter of Austin. So we're still, like I said, a family business there. Um, what's kind of nice for us is uh, we're a woman owned uh, family, uh, woman owned small business. So Judy owns a little bit more than, than Rolf. So we're classified as a woman owned small business. So uh, that gets us a, a lot of benefits with um, with certain customers. So I encourage you to, to, to keep that in mind. Uh, you know, when you're when you're talking with customers or filling out the forms that we are a woman owned small business and we have the documentation that uh, that we can get for you for that. Um, we're headquartered here in Des Plaines, Illinois. Uh, it's a suburb of Chicago. We're actually right at the end of O'Hare Airport. So um, before I forget, I'd like to invite each and every one of you. If you're ever passing through the Chicago area, if you have a layover at O'Hare, please uh, you know, let us know. We can stop by and pick you up. Or if you're traveling through the area, uh, the highway is uh, about a mile or so away from us. So if you're going through Illinois, either through uh, visiting Chicago, or if you're going up to Indiana or um, up to uh, Wisconsin, we're right there. So please stop by. Like I said, you have an open invitation. Uh, contact any one of us here and we, we can arrange for a tour for you. We love showing off our facility. Um, we have a 70,000 square foot facility here. This is probably the third or fourth different facility that Lamar just had, and we've been here since uh, 1967 or so. Uh, so we've always been in this uh, general area here, just kind of growing in size as the needs from the factory uh, uh, dictate itself. So. Uh, we have uh, over 100 employees. Right now we're probably right about 120 employees, give or take through the factory and uh, you know the office and so forth. Um, our products are designed and manufactured here in the USA. So that's why I like to encourage people when they're coming through the area, uh, stop by and check out our factory. So uh, let's take a look at uh, the market served. Um, we're in a lot of different markets. So, you know, we're kind of known for uh, utility type chargers, uh, you know, maybe in the oil and gas. Uh, we also have telecom products. Uh, we're in the marine market. Uh, we're in engine start, we're uh, you know, in UPS, and some of these markets are, are, are growing for us. So uh, right now our current mix is we're still mostly in the utility uh, world. Uh, you know, we're, we've got a good chunk in telecom and also in engine start. Um, 
so we're, we're pretty well diversified because, you know, battery chargers are kind of universal. Like uh, what we saw with, with Austin first start out, uh, you know, from the first design by modifying a little bit, he could serve many different markets with it. So we continue uh, that philosophy today and, and we are in a lot of different markets and we um, we're also a customer uh, focused company. Um, so we like to uh, control all aspects of uh, our development process. So we have in-house resources, uh, so such as application engineers. Uh, you know, there's, there's several experienced application engineers here. And, uh, you know, as I forgot to mention early on in the beginning, this is our 75th year, uh, you know, being established in 1945. So we do have that experience. Uh, that we can build upon. So whether it's our application engineering uh, team, our design engineers, our mechanical engineers, our software engineers, um, we we're, we're, we're always have that, that knowledge base there to help customers out, even with custom solutions, because we're kind of known for uh, being able to provide a, a custom or semi-custom solution for a customer. Um, we also have service support, so we have a you know 24-hour uh, uh, emergency uh, phone number we support our products for a long time. You know, we, we know customers kind of like uh, if they got something installed, uh, they like keeping it going as long as they can. So we try to support our products for as long as we possibly can. Uh, we're also able to offer things like startup commissioning uh, to help customers out in that way. Uh, you know, we're an ISO 9001 2015 certified company. Uh, vertically integrated, as we'll see uh, in, in the next slide coming up here. Uh, Sales support. We we have the inside sales guys here, but we support uh, our rep network. So we have a traditionally strong rep network that uh, that we thrive on. So uh, we have a lot of reps here in the U.S. We have a couple of international reps, and uh, you know, we we also have a few uh, direct accounts in in places where we don't have reps. So we uh, cover the needs of the customer in in several different important ways. I mentioned us that we're vertically integrated. So let's take a look at some of those uh, processes there. Um, we believe in that because it's it's uh, we can control our own destiny, so to speak. So it kind of starts with our R and D and engineering team. Um, we have the electrical and mechanical guys, and so you know those are guys who design our circuits and maintain our existing products, come up with new products. So that all starts with our R and D and engineering guys. Um, so. For example, a circuit board. So not only do our guys lay out the circuit board and design the circuit board, but we also uh, have a circuit board department here. So we can actually build the board right here um, at the factory with, uh, you know, without uh, uh, controlling all those uh, processes. So we can do uh, through hole boards, you know, traditional, uh, the older type circuit boards, as well as the new surface mount circuit board. So uh, we're, we're have a state-of-the-art uh, uh, facility up there, so uh, we can control what we need to do. We have a uh, you know a lot of variety in products, but we don't have a whole lot of one type of circuit board. So uh, you know we have a high different kind of mix of products, but we do have a, a low run on each one of those. Um, magnetic. So our, our electrical guys, you know, they design the transformers, and we actually wind the transformers right here. So if there's a ever any issue out with uh, with the way a transformer design is going or, and uh, the production of it, um, we can come right back in here and, and sit down with the engineers. We don't waste any time at all. Everybody is right here under the same roof. Um, production lines, so we're set up uh, a couple of different ways. We, we go for very large units and we're kind of staggered all the way down to uh, medium through small units. Uh, one thing that we also have is um, wire harness department. So we actually use wire harnesses inside our units. It's not, uh, uh, it makes for a, um, a more reliable, a better quality product and it actually speeds up the production process. Uh, we do have a fabrication department, so we can make modifications to enclosures, build brackets, uh, whatever they need inside of, an, of a battery charger enclosure. And uh, finally, uh, Every unit that we make is 100% tested and inspected. So every unit gets a test card, and those are kept on record here in case the customer needs to uh, know what an, ex uh, what an option is uh, later on they had in their particular charger, or if there is uh, some sort of issue that uh, they need to troubleshoot with our service department. We can go through and see exactly how that charger left the factory and how it was set and so forth. 
So let's talk about some of the things of why LaMarche, uh, you know, what sets LaMarche apart and why what we feel are differentiators between us and uh, a lot of our competitors. So, uh, you know, starting way back with Austin and continuing to this day, LaMarche has always been an engineering based company. So again, we do all that engineering and, and manufacturing house, whether, like I said, circuit board, software, magnetics, enclosures, et cetera. Uh, some of the other things that we do is we like to give our engineers all the latest tools and software. So uh, they have the latest in the circuit simulating software, uh, all the uh, the analysis uh, software and tools that they need to uh, to design units and to make sure that we are still providing a, a, a good quality product out to the world. Um, on the mechanical side of things, today these days we do everything in 3D modeling, so you can see that off to the right of the screen. So that allows us to, the flexibility to optimize product designs. Uh, you know, so we can reduce uh, production issues ahead of time. We can physically look at a model. You know, the engineers can look and see, well, okay, this isn't going to work. This, it, you know, there's going to be an interference here. Or we also can look and make sure that our products are user friendly. Hey, can a customer get to uh, the terminals? You know, are they are they put in in appropriate locations? Um, you know, and also with the software, we can also do things like um, uh, thermal uh, simulations to make sure that the enclosure design isn't going to overheat, you know, or the ventilation hole is pl uh, placed properly. So that allows us uh, all those, we like to give our guys all those tools to, uh, to do their job as effectively as they can. So another thing, and probably what we feel that the biggest differentiator of, of Wyla Marsh is the technology. We're the only battery charger manufacturer in the world that manufactures four different battery charger technologies. So we have the, the control mag amp, which is what that A9, the org Electra I spoke about earlier, our, our first charger design is. We also have the ferro resonant uh, type uh, battery chargers, SCRs, switch mode. Um, what that gives us with all those different technologies is we can offer the customer the flexibility of choice. So we're not uh, forcing a mag amp on him or an SCR charger on him because that's the only thing that we make. We can sit down and we can talk with a customer and say, okay, what's important to you, Mr. Customer? Is it uh, is it performance? How you know how well a charger performs? Is it the physical size? Or it might be cost. You know, he needs the most cost effective uh, solution out there. So uh, again, we we like to say, giving the customer the flexibility of choice sets us apart from all the other. Uh, all the other charger manufacturers and from all those other things that I mentioned uh, we're vertically integrated and we have the you know the in-house uh, engineers including software engineers it allows us to customize a product for a customers needs so we're not uh, you know necessarily cookie cutter but we can uh, you know make it uh, for whatever way would work them by adding a little tweak or a little customization to it to make it uh, work ideally for them okay, the uh, the next part I want to run through here I want to spend a little bit of time on because uh, we think this is important um, is something we call battery basics. So this is kind of like a general over battery overview from a charger manufacturer's perspective. So uh, in the next few minutes, I'm going to run through some terms that you may have heard or you may not have heard of, uh, give you some basic ideas, talk a little bit about the different types of batteries that are out there and how they're important and uh, how they would basically relate into the battery charger world. So let's start. Um, what is it is as a battery? So a battery is nothing more than an electrical storage device for supplying DC power. So it stores it for some future use. Uh, the applications for um, storage batteries in the standby world could be for um, you know uh, utility applications, whether it's electric utilities, switching trip, uh, switch gear breakers, or in the telecom world, you know, providing a long duration backup for a, a cell site, for example. Um, batteries also used in the engine start world. So, you know, they're used for starting uh, engines, whether they would be in a, in a backup diesel or on a, uh, uh, a boat somewhere. So there's all kinds of different uses for batteries. Batteries are everywhere. So let's take a kind of a little closer look at, at what a battery is. It's nothing more than, a, than an electrochemical reaction. So basically, our, to, to build a simple battery, uh, you, you kind of need a couple different parts to it here. Uh, it started with two dissimilar metals. Uh, then you would have a positive and negative electrode, and then you have some sort of uh, electrolyte solution. 
And uh, so all that electrolyte solution is, is just the, the conductive means to support the electrical flow between uh, those two electrodes. Um, now, the, the next part I'm going to go in here for the, uh, the purposes of uh, our discussion here, I'm going to look at a lead acid battery uh, because as I'll talk about a little bit later, that's the most popular technology, uh, battery technology that's out there. And uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about here. We're not going to go into this into great detail at all. I mean, if, if you're interested, there's uh, you know, all the different battery manufacturers have uh, of all kinds of uh, white pages um, listed on there where you can go through and, and read this in, in a lot more detail. So the basic description of this, is, I'm going to go through something really quickly here. So let's take a look at this battery. Uh, we're going to call it a discharging battery. So you can see on the left side, we have the positive uh, terminal or positive plate. So as you see on there, it's lead dioxide, PbO2. And in the negative side over there, it's lead on that particular terminal. And so for being this is a lead battery, the electrolyte is um, sulfuric acid. So what we do is we, uh, you know, if we're going to start discharging this battery, let's put a load on it. So we're going to discharge this battery. So what happens is that chemical reaction starts taking place inside there. So th as the battery discharges, uh, the positive and negative plates become more and more chemically alike. And so what they'll end up with in the end is lead sulfate. So you've kind of heard that term, uh, a sulfate on a battery, uh, you know, if the battery sulfated. Um, so as this process moves forward and, you know, the positive and negative uh, posts become more and more alike, of, you know, with a lead sulfate, yeah. the battery acid drops. So as that battery acid uh, concent uh, concentration dilutes, it becomes more like water, but not quite like water. So eventually this happens. Uh, so the battery becomes uh, so discharged, it can't deliver any more electricity or um, at, at a useful voltage, or you simply just disconnect the, uh, the battery from the, from the load. So moving forward, Let's take a look at what happens in the, the positive, uh, sorry, the, the charging process. So we're going to hook up a, a charging voltage. Uh, and when we do that, uh, you know, hook it up to the positive and negative. Now, remember, these things are starting out uh, with the positive and negative plates, both alike with lead sulfate. Uh, chemically, that would be PBSO4. Uh, so as we connect the, the charger to that and, and the, the chemical reaction, we serve at, at, at both positive and negative plates. So the material on the positive plate is converted back into lead dioxide, and the material on the negative plate is converted back into lead in, in, in the example here of our lead acid battery. So the, the sulfate from the plates that were on there too kind of returns into the electrolyte solution, making it more and more concentrated uh, as a higher level of uh, sulfuric acid. So that's kind of the simple um, explanation of, of the battery for the purpose here. I just kind of wanted to let you guys see what that part of that process looks like. Um, because that's, after all, that's what our charger is doing. So it's 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 actually recharging uh, those particular batteries that way. So let's take a look at battery construction. So battery construction hasn't really changed a whole lot uh, in the last uh, 120 years or so. The only thing that really kind of changed is the packaging uh, materials and the manufacturing processes have improved. I mean, lead still lead. Uh, so let's kind of take a look at that battery construction. Uh, I talked about the container, so that's the, the outside, uh, the enclosure part, if you will, that kind of holds all this stuff together. Uh, typically, that's a, a plastic or a thermoplastic type material these days, uh, but back in the old days, it, it was a, a glass jar. So um, in between there, if we look at uh, the, the number two there on the left side, we see these plates, the positive and negative plates. So in a lead battery, these plates are made out of lead. So it really consists of a grid and a lead paste on there. And actually with these plates is how the battery designers control the properties of the battery. Uh, for example, thicker plates are used for a longer discharge. Uh, and it also gives you longer life is something you might see in a utility application you know, where I'm backing something up for eight hours or a telecom application where likewise I might be backing something for eight or even 24 hours. Um, conversely, if I need something for high discharge, for example, like an in-engine start application, those plates are more, much thinner than those other uh, plates for the, the other standby application. So the thinner plates help you get rid of the energy uh, out of the battery, out of the chemical reaction much, much quicker and delivered to the load in, in a short amount of time. Uh, 
So um, that's just some of the ways that uh, you know a battery designer or a battery manufacturer can control what those batteries are. So you may have looked at a, a you know a battery catalog or on a website and see that these batteries are for uh, different usage, you know, long duration or high rate. Uh, you know, in another application, that's how they do it. It's how they control the processes is with the actual plates. Um, moving ahead, uh, between the positive and negative plates, there's something called the plate separators, and that's literally what they are. They're, they're to physically keep the positive and negative plates separate from each other so they don't uh, short out. So they're typically made out of um, an insulated, uh, really porous, thin material. And then around all of that, and you know, around the plates is the electrolyte solution um, that we talked about in, in our uh, battery example a few slides ago. So again, that's the conductive means for the electrical flow between the positive and negative plates in, in a battery. And finally, we have the terminals. So in the terminals in the battery, what you do, we take all the negatives and connect them together and come up to one common point for the customer. Same thing with the positive. So the the, uh, the terminals are, if you looked inside of the battery, if you cut it uh, in half, kind of like what we're showing here on our um, on the screen, you're going to see all those plates connected together, whether to be positive or negative. So speaking of cutting a battery in half, um, let's take a look at a slice battery. So what you can sort of see, let me see if I can highlight, uh, turn the, the highlighter thing on. Laser pointer, there we go. So in this section right here, uh, that's something that we're going to call a cell. So inside of a cell, if you notice, there's a lot of positive and negative plates. A cell isn't just one positive and one negative plate, you know, like you initially may think of. It's had a lot of plates inside of a cell. And what that does, it, it actually gives the battery more capacity so I can get more current out of it or I can get a longer backup time out of it. So that's how you do it with with the individual cells. So inside of a cell, there's many different positive and negative plates with their separators. So those cells are all connected together to, to form the overall battery. So if you look, this battery looks kind of um, maybe familiar to you. Uh, this is actually a 12 volt battery. So a 12 volt battery is six cells, two volts per cell. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But if I look and I count, I got one, two, three, four, uh, five, six cells. So that's a six cell or 12 volt battery. So if you were to cut one of those apart, that's what you're going to see inside. All right, so let's take a look at um, some battery types. Um, so there's there's many different uh, battery types. The difference basically is in the chemicals they use to make up the battery. So they all have different characteristics, different properties to which the you know the battery designers tailor to meet specific needs or applications. At the same time, they may add certain materials in there. You know, I, in my ideal world example, I use uh, lead and and uh, lead dioxide as the paste, uh, but they may add things like antimony or calcium or selenium in there that, that gives the battery different properties and may let it uh, to cycle better. You know, a cycle is a charge discharge cycle, so it may increase that ability to the battery or it may increase the battery's tolerance to uh, heat. Or, or give it some other beneficial properties for, for the design. So let's take a look at the, the common types. Um, lead acid, uh, that's the most popular type battery still around today. You know, uh, over 120 years later, uh, you know, I, every time I go to a trade show or something, I always hear the, the, uh, the battery guys, the traditional guys saying, well, lead's not dead. Um, so lead is still the most popular. Uh, Probably the second most popular type is the nickel cadmium or NICAD batteries. Uh, we see a lot of those. Um, other types that are out there, uh, lithium ion, there's there's various types of lithium ion that you've seen today. Uh, there's other uh, technologies, nickel, nickel metal hydride. Uh, there's some other ones involving other various materials that people are constantly trying to develop. And they all have different properties. You know, they might be a, a faster recharge time or, or better for, uh, uh, you know, electric vehicles of, of getting uh, energy out quicker. Um, but for us in LaMarche, and, you know, I said this is, this talk is from the battery charger guy perspective. Uh, lead and NICAD are the, the two most common types for us. 
So I talked about typical voltages before. So a uh, typical voltage for a lead battery is two volts per cell. So if I have six cells, that's how I get my nominal 12 volt uh, on a battery. Um, with a nickel cadmium battery, it's a little bit different. The nominal voltage there is 1.2 volts per cell. So in something of a 24 volt nickel cadmium uh, cell, uh, sorry, battery, uh, you might have 18 of those batteries at 1.2 volts. To, to get you up to your uh, 24 volt nominal range. Uh, so let's take a look at, you know, I said lead is the most popular type for us. Uh, lead can be broken down a little bit further. So let's take a look at that. So uh, the most, uh, the traditional type is something called the VLA or vented lead acid. So these are also the flooded cells uh, and the, uh, uh, the wet cells. So what the, the, the notable thing about these particular batteries is you can replace the electrolyte. And also the electrolyte uh, can be checked. Uh, these are the batteries, the older type batteries that had um, uh, vent holes, uh, sorry, um, uh, vent caps on them. So you can remove the vent caps and part of your periodic uh, monthly maintenance was you would top off the, uh, the electrolyte levels in the batteries. And you could also put a hydrometer in there and, and check the specific gravity readings of the batteries. So you can get an indication of the state of health of the battery. So this is was is the more traditional type battery. So they've been around for for many, many years and uh, they're, they're still in large use today. Uh, you know, the 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 VLA battery has not uh, gone away. It's still a workhorse in the battery industry. Uh, newer battery technology that that came around uh, probably in the late 70s or so and became popular in the 80s, uh, is something called a VRLA battery. And what that stands for is a valve regulated lead acid battery. Uh, now, early on, sometimes these were called sealed batteries or maintenance free batteries, but neither one of those terms is true. Uh, they're not sealed. Uh, they do have vent caps on the top. So if, if the pressure builds up too much inside the battery, uh, it, you know, instead of exploding, they will release to the atmosphere and vent. And um, I wouldn't call them maintenance free. Um, I would call them low maintenance uh, because, well, with the maintenance free implies that I don't have to do a thing to it. But uh, in reality, you still have to check the, the connections to make sure that they're clean and tight. So if any of you ever uh, lived up in a northern climate, uh, you know how that corrosion in the wintertime kind of builds up gook on, on the batteries in our car. Those are, are kind of uh, what used to be called a maintenance free battery. So, you know, periodically we got to clean those terminals up just to make sure we have a good tight connection and we're getting all the power out of the battery into the load that that's possible. Um, some of the other characteristics of a VLA battery. Um, I said that they were uh, people call them sealed. Uh, they're extremely low gassing compared to a VLA battery. Uh, so that's led some people to kind of use the marketing term that they were sealed, but they are very low gassing and can be used in applicant. They can be used in locations where uh, previously you could not use a VLA battery. Uh, they also have the characteristics of being spill proof, as we'll see in a, in a second here when I talk about the different uh, VLA types of batteries. Uh, you can actually uh, mount those in in, in different uh, uh, configurations then you could a, a VLA battery. So, you know, with the vent caps, you, you tilt that thing too far, you know, the electrolyte spill out. With a VRLA battery, it's pretty much spill proof. So of those VRLA types I was talking about, uh, the two types that I want to mention here are AGM, and AGM is stands for absorbed glass mat. And in that type of battery, an AGM battery, the separators not only separate the positive and negative, but they also contain the liquid electrolyte. Uh, so the separator is made of this highly absorbent, uh, like matted glass fiber. So picture like the mat is kind of like a sponge holding the electrolyte between the positive and negative plates. So being in the, that it's uh, kind of like that sponge fiber material that allows it not to be in necessarily in a, in a highly liquid form that would run out. So it gives you the, that uh, uh, the spill proof uh, uh, component that I was talking about. Uh, the next battery that you hear a lot of in, in the VRLA world is a gel cell or gel electrolyte battery. 
uh, in that particular battery, the electrolyte is actually gelled and it, it kind of looks and uh, has the consistency of petroleum jelly. So that's between the positive and, and the negative plates all around the battery inside there. So that's uh, the electrolyte uh, means in, in that particular battery. Um, again, the, these batteries here have advantages and disadvantages that uh, is beyond this, uh, the scope of this uh, conversation here, but uh, I, I suggested if you're interested in learning more about those different types, there's all kinds of information out there that uh, from battery manufacturers that you can go educate yourself on on the different types and, and why you would choose an AGM over a gel cell. But again, the purposes of our talk is charging the battery and uh, on that end, these are all very similar batteries to us. So next thing I want to talk about is some common battery terms. Um, you know, going back when I first started here at, at LaMarche, um, this part confused me for a little bit, to be honest, because I'm talking to people on the phone and they're telling me, I'm talking to one guy and he's telling me he's got cells. I talked to another guy, he's got miles, he referred to his batteries as modules. Another guy calls them strings. Uh, somebody else calls them jars. Some people call them blocks. The truth is they're all batteries. So for example, I, I could have uh, 12 cells of light acid, or I could have two modules, or I could have a 48 volt string. I could have six jars of lead acid. Remember I told you the earlier days, um, the, the containers were actually jars and some of the big batteries, uh, just for the strength of it, uh, they're actually physical gl glass jars for the, for the larger amp hour sizes. So the thing to keep in mind, all those terms, cells, modules, strings, jars, and blocks, they're all batteries. Uh, so let's take a look at some of the, the, the typical battery uh, configuration. So. Um, they can kind of come into a two volt and uh, you can sort of see here. This is what I was talking about. That's one of the clear jar type batteries. So it's a larger amp hour cell. That's actually only a two volt cell. Oh, sorry, uh, yeah, two volt cell. So that's just one cell. So if I add a 20 volts, 24 volt system, I need 24 of those jars. So that was actually more and it was more like a jar. So this is a three cell or a six volt type configuration. As you can see, I got three cells there. Uh, probably a, a more typical one that you might see is the 12 volt or the six cell one. So uh, if you roughly, you can almost see the, the breakpoints here of the six cell compartments inside that particular battery. So uh, it's just a, a couple different ways that batteries are packaged. So let's take a look at some of the further ones. So these are the large uh, VRLA type batteries. So uh, these particular batteries come with integral um, mounting provisions inside the battery. So it's not a separate battery uh, tray or a shelf or a um, uh, container, for example. It, it's all racked internally to uh, the battery. They're modular, so you can sort of build them up, whether I have different configurations, rows, or, or, um, or height for that. Uh, some of these are, here's a couple examples of front terminal batteries. They became popular because uh, the terminals being on the front here, now I don't need access along the top there. If I think of I'm talking about a top cell, a stop cell battery, we'll see in a second, um, you know, I need to get, uh, I can't put anything right on top of that because let's face it, I need room to get my hand inside there to make the connections to, to work on the battery. So these front terminal batteries allow you to mount them kind of close together, like in this telecom configuration. So some more top terminal batteries and those I like I said earlier you need access to the top of those particular ones to uh, you know to make the connections and if they are a vented battery uh, VLA battery then you need to check the electrolyte so you need access to the top. So um, here's a, a better look at a flooded battery installation and you can see these are big big cells a lot bigger and they take up a lot more room they're, they take up they're a lot higher than those other examples that I gave you. Uh, this battery rack that we see here is actually a um, a two tier rack. So we can see the, the batteries are one on top of the other. And if you can look, hopefully you can sort of see in between there, I do have room there that I can actually make my connections and actually check the electrolyte level. Uh, next one is, let's look at a NICAD 
battery example. So actually this is a stepped battery rack. So you can actually see that it's kind of like a step. But again, NICAD batteries, I need to have access to, to, the, to the top parts for, for the connection points. So I was looking at a quick look at some of the types of, of batteries. So uh, I want to quickly run over two types of, uh, of service that are out there. Float service is the one that we most often deal with. Uh, in those application, the battery is permanently connected to the charger. So um, usually they're a standby application. So uh, no backup for emergency lights or, or some sort of uh, switchgear system. So the battery is seldom required to deliver any significant current to the load. It's just there for, for standby or emergency situations. Um, the other one is a cycle service. Uh, think of this as like a forklift, you know, a battery operated forklift truck. So there the battery is the primary source of power. So in those situations, uh, you know, if it's a lift truck, um, I, you know, I plug it at the beginning of the day, I drive around for the, the, you know, the hour shift, at the end of the day, I plug it back in. So uh, there's the, the connection and disconnection, or a golf cart uh, battery is, is a perfect example of that too. Uh, most of the charges that, that we, we're going to deal with here at Lamarche are going to be the float type battery chargers. Um, I want to run by a, a, a couple of quick terms uh, to you guys so you can understand what the, what those means. Uh, first one would be float charge. Um, that's the normal charge mode of, of a battery. So that's what you do to maintain the battery. So when you hear somebody talk about the float voltage, that's what the, the battery is at uh, the, the vast majority of the time. Um, the other charge, a uh, term that, sorry, that you might hear is equalized charge. Um, Generally, depending on the battery, let's talk a flooded battery or VLA uh, wet cell battery. Um, if the uh, the battery is sit for a while, uh, sometimes what happens, like you know, in the standby application, like we've been talking about, sometimes the cells uh, start uh, becoming unbalanced at different levels. So think of an equalized charge is the process of uh, uh, charging it at higher voltage and bringing all those cells back up to the same potential. Uh, think of it, I got something there and I got a big stick inside there and I'm stirring the pot to, to bring everything back up on uh, at the same uh, charge potential. Um, usually, like I said, that's only done on, uh, uh, usually done on VLA batteries. On rare occasions, you'll do it uh, on a VRLA battery, and that's usually when, and I would, it's only when recommended by the battery manufacturer. And typically they have you do that if the battery is set on charge for, you know, uh, a period of months. So they might recommend that you give it a freshening or an equalized charge before you put it into service. So again, that's at the, the recommendation of the battery manufacturer. Uh, some other things that, that we think are important here, uh, some factors that affect battery life. Uh, number one is temperature. Uh, so for every 15 degree increase in temperature above 77 degrees Fahrenheit, um, 77 degrees Fahrenheit is like the magic temperature for batteries. That's where all the ratings occur at. Uh, that's their ideal situation. So everything is kind of based off that. So for every 15 degrees above 77, you're going to reduce the life by 50%. Now think about that. That's a significant number. Um, it, it's... Uh, it, critical that you keep the battery as cool as you can. Now, there's some applications where the location simply is hot and there's nothing you can do about it and you have to live with it. So in those type applications, uh, if you can't cool the battery down, then you're looking at uh, a quite frequent uh, battery replacement intervals than you would if something was in a uh, air conditioned uh, 77 degree environment. So uh, the other thing that's really, really critical about Battery life is uh, proper float voltage. It's critical that the charger has good output regulation that it maintains and holds the proper charging voltage when you set it there. Uh, both under and overcharging a battery are bad for it. Overcharging uh, heats it up and undercharging causes uh, the plates to sulfate, resulting in shorter battery life, significantly shorter battery life. Now, this is especially true on a VRLA battery. Now, think back to what we were talking about. Uh, the reason why it's really important in a VRLA battery, the top sealed. I, I can't get in if it was a flooded battery and I needed electrolyte. I just removed the vent caps and I add electrolyte to it. In a VRLA battery, I cannot do that. The top is sealed. Uh, the other factor is maintenance. And this is really important on flooded cells. Uh, 
you, you got to make sure that you don't boil the electrolyte out of a flooded cell, and you got to make sure that the terminals aren't really corroded and, and, and bad. You got to make sure that they're clean and tight. Um, the other factor, and I'm going to spend a couple of quick slides on this because I think this is important. It's um, AC Ripple. So an unfiltered battery charger, it produces a phenomenon called AC Ripple during the rectification process. And uh, that's anybody's battery charger, not just a Lamar's battery charger. All unfiltered chargers produce ripple. So the AC ripple rides on the charger's DC output, and what it in effect does, it produces a lot of small and discharge cycles in the battery. So what this causes the battery to do is to excessively heat up, leads to shortened battery life. Again, this is really critical in a VRLA battery because I cannot add electrolyte to it. So that really shortens the life for that. So let's take a little closer look at uh, at Ripple. Um, usually when uh, I talk to people for the first time, you know, whether they're uh, reps or, or customers, um, I, I say if there's one thing that that you realize is is the following, that uh, if you have a VRLA battery, just make sure that you're using a properly filtered battery charger for it. It really would save yourself a lot of headaches down the road. So let's take a look at why Ripple voltage matters. Um, sometimes there's loads, the, the load cannot tolerate high ripple voltage. Uh, you know, for example, if it's a telecom load, sometimes they're sensitive, you know, they're electronic. So uh, they rely on the, that filtering from the battery and from the charger to, to work properly. Uh, as I talked about before, uh, with high ripple, it, it, there's the, uh, the charge and discharge cycles on top of, of the, the, the battery nominal voltage. Uh, it causes that battery to heat up and again, shortens the life of the battery. Um, talked about the heating there. It also increases positive grid corrosion, and that's a, another determining factor, uh, a major player for shortening battery life. Uh, it also, you can lose capacity over time because of the ripple. Dry out, uh, I mentioned before in the VRLA batteries, uh, you can't uh, get inside there to to add more electrolyte to it, so it dries those batteries out, greatly reducing their service life. Um, the thing to remember, I mean, less ripple will improve the service life of all batteries. So some typical recommendations um, from the battery manufacturers for a VRLA battery, they'd like for you to keep the ripple uh, below a half percent, uh, the ripple voltage that is. And uh, you know all types is there's some recommendations there for the for the ripple current. Um, so important again the takeaway is you have a VRLA battery, make sure you're using a filtered battery charger. Um, one other thing that I kind of want to take some time here to uh, to clarify. Uh, in the last couple of years, I think this has been a point that's uh, that's really caused some confusion. Um, in the battery charger world, there's something called NEMA PE5, and that was the gold standard for battery chargers. All the manufacturers followed that. They all pre pretty much participated on the NEMA committee to write the standard, and it gave it was to give a user a, uh, an idea of what a battery charger should do and ways to measure different parameters such as regulation and filtering so that he'd be looking at apples to apples. So NEMA defined the filtering level as unfiltered, filtered, and this term called battery eliminator. Um, all that really meant it was a um, it was a term for the level of filtering, not literally to remove uh, the battery. So to eliminate that confusion, um, a few years back IEEE 2405, uh, through the blessing of NEMA, uh, decided to take over the NEMA PE5 standard and rewrite that. It was, it's been uh, probably 23 years since the standard was updated, so it needed to be updated. So in the new standard that's uh, in its final stages of voting now, what you're going to hear are level zero, which is an unfiltered charger through the old NEMA days. Um, what used to be called filtered in the NEMA standard is now going to be called level one. And this really confusing term here, battery eliminator, is now going to be called level two. And this chart is just tells you what the uh, the filtering levels are going to be for each one of those. Uh, if you're looking at the Lamarsh uh, uh, chargers, whether it's uh, an A77 or a TPSD, these charts are on the on the data sheet. So I'd like to pass on a couple little tips here, I guess. So I already talked about the term battery eliminator. Um, it, it's just a, a ripple specification limit, and don't take it literally. Um, in a lot of uh, situations that we'll see when we talk about the DC system later on, 
uh, batteries are required to operate loads uh, when you know when AC supply is off or the charger is off. So you need a battery for that. Um, for certain type of loads, a charger can't support any momentary transit loads like a high end rush without the assistance of a battery. So in those situations, you need the battery anyway. You know, a charger is uh, it, it's it's a machine, so um, it takes it's got to convert AC into DC by however means it does that before it can deliver uh, power to the load. A battery we saw is electromechanical, sorry, electrochemical uh, uh, reaction, and it can supply power instantaneously. So if something like a load breaker, um, a battery charger without a battery, most likely does not have enough um, uh, power or current to clear that load fast enough. So that load fall fast enough. So that's why you kind of need the battery for that. So again, I want to stress that the term battery eliminator does not mean I'm eliminating the battery from the circuit. Many times you can, but you know, it depends on the type of load it is. If it's a high inrush transit load, you definitely cannot do it. So let's talk a little bit about battery capacity. Um, battery capacity is rated in amp hours, and it kind of gives an idea of how much capacity uh, a battery has. Uh, it's typically in standby applications expressed in amp hours at an eight hour rate down to 1.75 volts per cell and to an end voltage of 77 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's the, the standard for all the batteries. So when, when you're looking at uh, uh, competitor X, 125 amp hour battery, it's me measured the same way as competitor B. So in simple terms, you know, one amp supplies for one hour is one amp hour. Again, that's the amp hour capacity of the battery. Um, the other thing is the capacity is not linear. The efficiency of a battery is different at different discharge rates. So uh, when you're discharging at a low rate, the energy is delivered more efficiently than you would be if you're discharging at a high rate. So just keep in mind that it, it's not linear and you can't uh, interpolate, uh, interpolate uh, through the graphs for that. So let's take a quick look at how it size a battery. Again, this is something that's uh, that's uh, really uh, quick and straightforward. Ideally, you'd be using this through um, through a program and through the IEEE 450 standard. But some things that I need to know for sizing a battery. I need the load current requirement in amps. I need to know what the backup time is. You know, is it is it uh, 15 minute backup or is it uh, eight hours? I need to know the end voltage. I said most of them are specified down to 1.75, but a particular load may require that to uh, to go down even deeper a little bit, or maybe not as deep. We also need to know the application. You know, uh, uh, as we saw from the plates, a a uh, engine start battery is different than uh, a telecom battery, a long duration battery. And then there's other things called the re the required aging factor and design margin. So uh, to kind of tell you what those are briefly, aging factor. Uh, allows for the fact that as a battery uh, ages, it loses capacity. So you want to make sure that at the end of its design life, uh, the battery still has enough power to to meet the the, the design load demands. And the other thing is design margin, and that kind of uh, allows for added loads during uh, the life of the battery. You know, you might want to add another two amps or you plan on doing that a, a couple years down the road. So once you have that information, you can consult the, the battery chargers data sheets and uh, let's take a quick look at an example. So let's say we made all those calculations and uh, we decided uh, that based on the calculation, we need 14 amps for eight hours. So I, I got one uh, just a, a general chart here that I kind of pulled up. And so we look, there is the eight hour uh, section of time. And these are different battery model models with the different amperages down there. So I say I needed 14 amps, so I follow this down to uh, I say, oh, there's 15.6 amps. OK, so that one will work. So I follow that across and it's this particular uh, battery right here, this M12V125 uh, from this particular manufacturer. So if I look at that, then that particular battery here tells me that's 125 amp hour battery at the eight hour rate down to 1.75 like we were talking about before. So that's the kind of simple way that uh, that we size uh, batteries. Um, most often battery size is given to us. A customer says, you know, it's this type of battery. It's uh, 80 amp hours. It's 200 amp hours. I need a charger for it. Um, another thing I want to kind of close up here with batteries is something called series and parallel strings. So batteries are often used in, in series and parallel combinations to get whether it's the desired voltage I need 
or the uh, desired capacity um, in a parallel connection. Um, simply the, the positives are connected together and the negatives are connected together. And what that gives me, it increases amp hour capacity. So if this was 100 amp hour. So now I have a 12 volt, 200 amp hour battery. DC voltage stays the same. In a series connection, um, I have uh, the, the batteries, the 12 volt, 100 amp hour batteries connected in the series. So the negative from one battery connects into the positive of the other battery. So I'm measuring across these two, I'm going to get 24 volts. And so what I've done is I increased the voltage, but my capacity stays the same. The amp hour size stayed the same. So this is going to be a 2400 amp hour uh, capacity. OK, so that's the, the basic DC system. I'm uh, sorry, the battery basic. So let's take a look at a, at a quick DC system. Um, so generally consists of a battery, a charger and a load. So it's a pretty simple, straightforward layout there. Um, part of the normal operation is uh, that the charger provides power for the continuous loads and it maintains the charge on the battery. So if I had an event that I have a power failure, I have the batteries there to power the load. So that's why we talked about the importance of a battery and not use that term battery eliminator too literally. Um, the way that these things are connected um, all in, the, in, that, uh, in that parallel system like that means that there is zero um, switch over time. So the customer will see no interruption from load uh, during the AC power failure and the time that the battery instantaneously takes over and supplies uh, the load. So let's look at what carries the load, the, the battery or the charger. So in this particular uh, diagram right up here, we have a, a typical load profile. So we have the discharge current, uh, the load profile example, and uh, here I got the time. This could be eight hours, uh, it could be uh, four hours, it could be 20 minutes. But for argument's sake here, let's just say that that's an eight hour uh, profile, load profile for that. So across here we have the, the battery charger's rated capacity. So for argument's sake, let's say it's a 25 amp charger. So these smaller loads below the rating of the charger are sourced by the charger. The charger is going to supply all those. So for these large dynamic loads, these two guys right here, those are going to be supplied by the battery and the capacity of the battery is going to be replaced by the charger, such as something with a uh, switch gear type application. So generally the charger decides to handle all those steady state loads with the excess capacity um, there to recharge, uh, sorry, the, to recharge the battery. Um, you know, this is a, a, the typical uh, battery charger uh, layout and the way that those work. And the, part of the reason too that we said that we have um, the, the battery uh, size to carry the uh, instantaneous loads, um, let's for argument's sake say that this peak here was 400 amps for uh, you know a couple of seconds or a minute, let's say. Uh, now this charger, it's only 25 uh, amps, like we said. In order for that to handle that, you'd have to rate the charger so much higher. It'd have to be a, at least a 400 amp charger. So now I've greatly increased the cost of the charger when I can effectively do it by having the, the nominal size battery charger here and having the battery that's, that's ideally uh, sourced to supply that instantaneous load. OK, I'm going to quickly go through some charger technologies um, that are out there. Uh, so as, as we kind of move through these, I'll, I'll point out some of the circuit differences to you. Uh, but since this is kind of a basic uh, 101 type class, I won't go into a lot of great detail on the circuit topologies. Um, you know, we will cover those more uh, in the detail in, in future webinars, and we do have white papers available online that that will tell you a little more detail about what that. So the over the years, the battery charger technologies have been developed to to improve several things. Um, you know whether it's the uh, efficiency, the reliability, the performance, the size and cost. Uh, so these all have uh, you know different values and different merits to different customers. So each technology has its advantages and disadvantages when compared to another technology. So that's the reason why there is different technologies out there. So. That being said, let's take a look at the megamp. 
So the MAGAMP is kind of what, uh, you know, I mentioned it earlier before. It's the, what the org elector is. It's what uh, Lamarche was, was founded on. So, uh, you know, in the early part of the 1900s, uh, you didn't have transistors or things like that. So you had to find ways to, uh, to you know, regulate power. Uh, you'd have to have uh, servos or, or modulators. Uh, one of the ways that they found to do this was something called a, a uh, magnetic amplifier. And that's kind of what we've uh, used here, uh, Austin used to uh, to uh, design the, the the MagAmp charger. So if we take a look, basic components, I got a transformer. I got this thing called a satchable reactor. So I said I was going to point out the special things. You see it down here in the circuitry. It's kind of uh, it's kind of in series with the AC input transformer. So the whole key to a MagAmp is a satchable reactor. So what it is, it's a very special magnetic. Uh, it consists of uh, two side legs, as we see here, and a uh, and those are connected to the AC section, and it also has a center coil that's connected to DC. So um, the variable impedance of the SAT reactor allows, and its location in the uh, the AC side of things allows us to uh, uh, to control the the output magnetically just by running a small amount of DC current through the center coil of that collector. So let's take a look at the advantages of the MagAmp. Um, the real advantage of the MagAmp is its simple long service life. They're practically bulletproof. Um, you know, we've had some people uh, say, you know, we talked to them about newer technologies or whatever. They say, you know what, do you still make that MagAmp? Uh, I like that. That's bulletproof. I just put it on the wall and basically forget it. So it, it gives years and years of service life. And why is that? Because if you look, there's not a lot going on. I said that the... Uh, that this whole operation kind of depended on uh, it was done magnetically, so it it doesn't have a lot of complicated components in it. Uh, it also has a wide frequency range because uh, it's kind of uh, impervious here. What's going on on the uh, the input side of things? Uh, you get uh, things like uh, inherent short circuit tolerance. Uh, it tends to fail safe, uh, you know, for the main control semiconductors. Uh, it has a lot of benefits there. Um, on the other side. Um, disadvantages, it's size and weight, especially when you compare it to the other technologies. And, and, and if you can sort of see what I mean by that is normally here's my power transformer, my input and output of the transformer. I got this other magnetic assembly hanging on the input side. So that increases the size of the enclosure, increases the weight of the enclosure. And also has an effect, a negative effect of, of lowering the efficiency a little bit. But, you know, somebody that wants a bulletproof design that lasts for years and years and years, this is the product for them. Uh, just threw a couple of pictures in here. This is a regular transformer that we saw on the input side, you know, the regular straightforward transformer. This is the satchel reactor. So you can see it looks a little different than the other transformer. So here's the two side legs on the outside, and that's what gets connected to the, to the AC uh, in, you know, in parallel, uh, sorry, in series with the, with the primary transformer. And this is the center coil, how we controlled the saturation level of that magnetic assembly. So it's kind of a, a, a cool, unique way of controlling the output. Moving ahead to the uh, controlled ferrule that came about and in, uh, invented by Joseph Sola uh, in the 30s sometime. Um, the major components of the, uh, the ferrule is the ferrule resonant transformer. And it main part of that is something called a resonant tank circuit. It's got the you know rectifier diodes converted again, surge protectors, and a control car. Um, kind of what's special about this, you know, I said I would point out the special things is the ferro resonant transformer. It's kind of a special transformer. It consists of uh, uh, it had basically has three windings and one assembly, and it also uses high grade uh, premium steel to get it the the special properties that it needs. So inside, I have the the input winding. And I have this thing called the tank or resonant winding, and that's where the term ferro resonant comes from. And I also have the output winding. So basically, the ferro resonant uh, transformer is uh, controlled by varying the voltage on the uh, the tank circuit, the secondary to tank circuit. So this is done by the control card switching the inductor in across the the, the portion of this winding using this thing called the triac. So it's kind of a, a simple way. Uh, simple effective way of of controlling a battery charger again uh, it's a lot of it's done magnetically uh, because there was no um, 
you know, no things such as uh, transform, uh, sorry, transistors in, in the beginning when these things were initially developed. Um, advantages of the, the control ferrule, and there's a lot with the control ferrule. It has high efficiency and high power factor. So of the conventional technologies, it, 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 it's the high performance type charger. It also has pretty good reliability, uh, not quite as good as the MagAmp, but really good reliability. Um, it generates uh, low input harmonics, uh, low EMI is generated. Um, you know, it's got a saturated secondary, so it, it's kind of, uh, it makes it inherent, uh, impervious as things happening on the input side, so you get the short circuit tolerance protection. There's a lot of good things happening with, with a ferrule. A um, couple of disadvantages. Um, I mentioned before this tank circuit, so it's sensitive to what's going on, on the input side of things. So if the input frequency is varying uh, by more than, uh, uh, you know, 5 percent, you know, from, for example, let's say 57 to 63 hertz, uh, say if this is going to a country where the power grid is is not that good, uh, you're going to have problems with with the ferro resonant transform, uh, ferro resonant charger. So it's kind of sensitive to what's going on. Or if you're trying to power this off a gen set, it's not very good. Um, some of the other things here are the the special steel that's required to it. Is it's a it's a little bit higher dollar steel, um, you know. And in in this uh, tank circuit here, uh, there is 600 volts AC present in there. So uh, some people uh, are not real comfortable working around that, but. Again, it's a technology that's been around for many, many, many years, and uh, and it's still used quite uh, quite a bit today. Here's a quick look at that ferro resonant transformer. So in this section, here's the input side of things, and and uh, you know the the tank circuit and the output uh, winding are kind of uh, wound on top of each other there. So it does have a unique look to it compared to uh, the straightforward transformer. Um, next technology that we're going to talk about is the SCR technology. Um, SCR chargers uh, started to become popular probably in the, the late 60s, early 1970s. Um, the, the main components here are the transformer again, um, an SCR, the silicon control rectifier, uh, surge protector, and a control card. Um, the basic way that kind of works is the charger is controlled by the SCR, so the control circuit, it determines what the output is what output is needed, and it switches on the SCRs at the appropriate time, uh, controlling the SCR conduction angle. So the conduction angle controls the amount of time that the SCR conducts during each sine wave cycle. So the, the longer the conduction uh, time, it provides a higher output, shorter conduction time uh, reduces the output. So it's kind of a, a really simple, effective way to, to control uh, the battery charge. Chief advantage for the SCR charger is low cost. Uh, this is the most popular battery charger uh, here in the U.S. Uh, these days, uh, mostly because it's it's cost effective. So it gives you a lot of benefits, uh, but it is the the uh, a a good uh, good charger for uh, for for the money. There, uh, it has good efficiency. Uh, the other good thing about an SCR charger is it has a wide range of output voltages and currents. I can, you know, make this up to a thousand amps or, or or more if I need to. It's easy to do with the SCRs compared to some of the other technologies. Uh, disadvantages: uh, it's this, the, you know, the EMI noise produced by the SCR switching. Uh, you know, it also tends to lower the input uh, THD, so uh, that can be a problem in in certain applications. Um, Moving along, we got the uh, the fourth technology, the high frequency technology. So, this is the uh, the newest technology in the in the battery charger world, per se. It became popular probably in the in the 1980s. Um, you can see the major components. There's uh, this is a greatly simplified block, block diagram for this. Uh, there's a lot of circuitry involved here. So there's the PFC circuit. Uh, there's a uh, uh, the input EMI filter that goes along with the power switching stages, uh, the high frequency transformer, uh, and there's uh, the output filter, and there's feedback circuitry. Um, there's a lot happening there. So uh, I mentioned it was a complex uh, operation, but you might say, why why do I want a high frequency charger? What does that give me? Um, it takes advantage of the the simple physics that uh, that states. Um, the higher the frequency, the smaller a transformer has to be for a given power level. So, uh, 
something that would be with a conventional technology, uh, you know, maybe something uh, uh, 12 inches by 12 inches, uh, you know, 12 inch cube. Now that gets shrunk down to the size of your fist. So it's 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 way smaller and it's significantly less weight. So there's a lot of benefit there by uh, using all this technology to come up with this different way uh, for um, power conversion. So that's why you see a lot of very small chargers and rectifiers today. Those are the high frequency uh, technology. You know, conversely, as long as I'm talking about that, that's why with a 50 hertz charger, sometimes it's bigger than it is than the 60 hertz version because you know the lower the frequency the larger the transformer has to be for a, a given uh, power level so the kind of way this roughly works here uh, the first stage of this provides the input uh, emi filter you know the power factor correction and the high dc bus voltage uh, getting it ready for up for the second stage so this cranks, uh, cranks up to roughly the 400 volt dc level and then the second stage here it's basically a DC DC converter section which takes that that high DC power from the first stage and switches it at a high frequency. So that's where the high frequency switching comes in. So from instead of a 60 hertz uh, switching frequency, now I'm up to thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of hertz uh, to get that transformer size down really small. So uh, the switch power is then applied to the the primary of a of a high uh, frequency power transformer. Um, then the DC voltage and current are, you know, control using the pole switch modulation uh, feedback controls uh, from the secondary to power transformer. It gets rectified just like a, a traditional uh, battery charger filtered. And, uh, you know, because it's high frequency, it has to get passed through some additional EMI filterings to, to filter out that other uh, noise that, that comes along with it. So the, it, as you can see, it's a really complicated process. But what does that give me? I, I talked about the size and weight, so the footprint's really, really small for this. It's high efficiency, you know, the, in, in, in this world today, um, high efficiency and high power factor, uh, you know, the power factor is near one, that accounts for a lot, you know, they're, they're, you know if you're something that's 97% efficient, you know, they, they even talk about tenths, you know, 97.1, 97.2, uh, it really matters that much that tenths matter. So uh, it does give you a lot um, a lot of advantages that the, the other technologies don't. Um, a lot of times it's hot swappable if it's into a, a rack system, which means I can, uh, without shutting down the DC system all, I can take one rectifier out and I can plug another one back in. Uh, so that that, uh, that helps uh, if I have to replace a rectifier uh, or charger quickly. It gives me advantage of that. Um, disadvantages, as you can probably tell, it's design complexity. With a whole lot of stuff going on, there's a lot of chance of stuff going wrong. But, you know, the proponents of that saying, OK, well, it's it's not a big deal. I, I can build in redundancy into my system. And it also takes me uh, 30 seconds to change out the uh, rectifier. So it's, uh, you know, what's important to the customer. Again, that's why we like to give the customer the flexibility of choice of what's important to him. So that kind of covers the uh, the charger technologies. Uh, just kind of wrapping things up there with with the different models that are out there from at least in the Lamarsh world of things. Uh, the SCR charger is our A77. The MagAmp is the H1B. The TPSD2 is the Faro, and we have a couple of versions of the high frequency, namely the N97 and A96 variants. Um, Taking a look at uh, wrapping up with the technology comparison, um, kind of the the quick summary thing. Uh, of the Faro, the MagAmp, SCR, and high frequency, ranked on the on the the good, better, best principle. So we can see the uh, performance. Uh, we we kind of talked about that's where Faro is strong and the high frequency uh, cost. Um, you know that's the SCR charger strong point. Longevity. That's the MagAmp charger strong point. Uh, size and weight. You know that advantage again kind of falls into the high frequency charger. Just to kind of sum things up for you. Um, here's a, a quick look at some of those other numbers that I talked about between the technologies, things like power factor, uh, you know, ranging from, from various uh, sizes here, efficiencies and uh, MTBFs, and it, it's sort of uh, the backup, backup data for that uh, previous bed, bed, uh, good, better, best uh, chart that I, I talked about. Um, again, a little more detail on the, the last slide that we have here. Um, kind of break things down by technology, the available voltage ranges. So you can see across the Lamarche line, uh, 
these chargers are available in all kinds of similar. Uh, there's a lot of crossover there. So uh, again, it, it helps that we we have all this uh, available uh, for customers. Uh, you know, to help meet their needs. So with that, that wraps up what I had in mind for today. Um, again, I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time uh, spending with us here today. And um, my contact information is here. Uh, email and phone number. So if there's any questions or anything that uh, that I can do or any question or anything that I can help you out with, please feel free to contact me.